morning, everyone. It is so very good to see you, and welcome to Preston Woods. Some of you are back today for the first time. Everyone online, we greet you as well. And uh, these are uh, prime time opportunities for us to seize the day and to preach the gospel, to teach God's word, and to pray. And thank you so much for your prayers today. And we were up, as uh, Jarrett Stevens just a moment ago mentioned, up in Washington, D.C. last Saturday in the prayer march. I told you about it uh, last week. We brought you some footage uh, because uh, we just felt it would be wonderful for you to, to see what happened and to remember that we are not standing alone in these battles that we're fighting and how we fight our battles, the Word of God, prayer. So uh, turn your attention to the screen and you'll see what happened. A little taste of heaven that happened up in uh, D.C. last Saturday. Hey everybody, we're getting ready for the prayer march here in Washington, D.C., the Lincoln Memorial behind me, Washington Monument in front. It's an incredible sight. Thousands of people all over the nation have gathered here. We're about to begin praying step by step, walking in prayer, praying for our president, praying for our nation, our Congress, our people, our churches. People are beginning to sing spontaneously. And I know you're joining us wherever you are today and after this day in praying for our country. The Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, seek my face, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. We're praying for hope. We're praying for healing for our nation in these days. It was uh, phenomenal, and uh, how about Ricky Skaggs up there praying with me as I went along, and it was good to see Ricky. He loves the Lord, and just so many people and friends, and as I mentioned to you uh, last week, uh, to know that we are together in Christ and praying and lifting up. The, the, there was a palpable sense of God's presence among us, 100,000 people uh, praising God and praying and lifting up uh, these prayers to the Lord. It was my privilege to close. Uh, the prayer service with a prayer for our nation and specifically a prayer for the Supreme Court. And uh, then to be in the Rose Garden. And the reason I mentioned being in the Rose Garden, because I know there's been some publicity about that and, um, and several of you have reached out and making sure that I'm okay. And yes, I am, I am ridiculously healthy. Let's just put it that way. And uh, I'm not sick. I'm fine. Uh, there are about eight people there. I exercised every day this week, Dr. Cooper, and flew to Atlanta to speak uh, with the vice president on Wednesday, and I uh, worked every day preaching three times this weekend, so I don't have COVID, let's just put it that way, and I'm grateful for that, and uh, we're grateful for God's protection always, but pray for those who do, and we prayed uh, for our president, and uh, we are so thankful for your prayers always. 
This is a very, very important message today, and it is certainly current uh, in the sense of what's going on in America, even in uh, the current election season. And it is a subject that uh, I've addressed in the past, a little over a year ago. Uh, the message uh, got quite a bit of attention, and it's, uh, it's, it's a message that needs to be heard. And uh, I've expanded this message at some level and, and learned some new things about my subject over the last 18 months or so. And I'm calling this message, Socialism, a Clear and Present Danger. I don't want you to think of socialism, Marxism, communism as being something across the seas or in another time or another place. Socialism is not a foreign affair. It is seducing Americans who choose to get in bed with Marxists and leftist politicians and liberal universities. And we are under attack by an age-old ideology and idolatry that you could call socialism or, again, Marxism. It's been around for a while, of course. 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. They were marching and changing the world. They were chanting, we are cold and we are tired and we are hungry, but we are changing the world. And indeed, the world was turned upside down by the Bolshevik Mar Marxist Revolution in Russia. And while Moscow was burning down and Russia was under siege. Do you know what the Orthodox Church of Russia was doing, the Christian Orthodox Church of Russia? Do you know what they were doing? At the same time people were chanting and burning in, uh, buildings in the streets, they were in white hot, red hot debate as to what color of vestments the priest ought to wear. Playing little church games while the world was coming apart. We need also to be reminded that the world is on edge right now, and that includes America. I want to remind you that socialism, Marxism, is a startup, a starter kit for advanced communism. When the government becomes the resident nanny of your life, telling you how to live, where you can go, how you can work, how much you can make, what you can buy, what you do with your life. And this ideology is virulent and violent. It will kill your soul, if you allow it, and kill the soul of a nation. And I warn you to say, in America, we are just one generation away for, from a recast of our nation as we have known it. Your children and our grandchildren are at risk, a clear and present danger. This propaganda is dangerous and deadly, and its power is being unleashed upon our country. And we must take a stand. We must all, we must take a stand against this in our churches. And yes, it's creeping into churches, liberal churches in particular. In our government, in our social institutions, in our colleges and universities, and in our homes. We must always stand for the principles of life given to us in the Bible. Don't blink. It's a worldview series because we are compelled on all the issues that we're covering right now to face the moral and social and, yes, political issues of our times and bring a prophetic voice to our community. As a pastor, I see it as my role to bring a pastoral vo voice, to bring God's Word in comfort and in counsel to inspire and to motivate, to build up. That's the pastoral calling that I have. But we also have a prophetic calling, don't we? When you read your Bible, you discover the prophets 
both called so-called major prophets and minor prophets, all had a major message for their generation. And typically, the prophets of yesteryear, including the apostles themselves in the New Testament, addressed the social, political, and cultural issues of their times. And all who love faith and freedom should hear this call. And we must build our nation continually on the foundations of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says, if the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? The battle that we face and the battle that we fight is not a battle between what is left and what is right politically, but what is right and what is wrong biblically. This message of hope requires courage and compassion. We're to speak the truth with love. We're to speak the truth with tears. When Jesus saw the multitude, they were scattered as those who did not have a shepherd like America today in so many ways. He had compassion upon them. And oh, how we ought to love our country and have compassion upon our nation. Jesus saw the multitude and he spoke, and he spoke of the issues that matter the most, including economic systems and political systems of the day. Just a few decades ago, the well-known ethicist and apologist Francis Schaeffer, a great man, said this, we as Bible-believing Christians are locked in a battle. This is not a friendly gentleman's discussion. It is a life and death conflict between spiritual hosts of wickedness and those who claim the name of Christ. Where is the clear voice speaking to the crucial issues of the day with distinctively biblical answers? Good question. What we're trying to do is this. Again, the question, where is the clear voice speaking to the crucial issues of the day with distinctively biblical answers. We must be the voice of reason. May we not sin through silence. I will not sin against God. I will not sin against you with silence. This is not a time for silence. This is a time to speak, to be bold, to be brave, to be courageous with compassion. May we not sin through silence. And so it's important that we deal with the issue of socialism because in our nation, we need to learn how to evaluate every ideology that comes along now, past, present, or future. So let's define our terms. Socialism is a political, philosophical, economic system in which there is government ownership of the means of production, and the primary focus is on providing equality of outcomes. Key phrase, equality of outcomes. We as Bible-believing Christians who believe in freedom and free enterprise, we believe, and we believe in America, historically in America, in providing equal opportunity, but knowing there are not equal outcomes. That's very important to remember. Socialism focuses on providing equal outcomes. In socialism, the government is all important and involved in every aspect of people's lives. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, Aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent upon no one, no one but God. And government is not God. Contrast socialism to the free enterprise system, which is an economic system in which there is private ownership of property and goods and means of productions are privately owned. In capitalism, free enterprise system, there is a very limited role of government. 
So a distinct difference. Which one is biblical? Which one is right? Which one is wrong? We are in the midst of a culture conflict over capitalism and socialism. As Christians, we are not bound to any political or economic system. And there are problems with capitalism over the issue of greed, corporate greed, and otherwise. And when we stand up against greed in capitalism, we must also stand up against greed in socialism. Because greed isn't a socialistic problem, nor is it a capitalistic problem. Greed is a human problem. And only God can deal with greed by changing the human heart. Regarding socialism, Marxism in America, a recent USA Today reports that 4 in 10 Americans, 4 in 10, 40% embrace some form of socialism. 43% of Americans now say socialism would be a good thing for the country, various forms. 51% believe socialism would be a bad thing for the country, so we're split. Again, lest you think this is for someone else, some other time, some other place, some other nation. No, we are divided right down the middle according to statistics, according to data on this issue. More and more Americans are leaning leftist to Marxist philosophies, especially younger people. A recent poll of millennials found that a majority, 58%, would prefer to live in a socialist nation than a capitalist nation. Only 33% of these could actually define socialism. So whether you're talking about so-called democratic socialism, Eastern or uh, European style socialism, pure Marxism, communism, all the rest, it is on the move. It's marching in our streets through organizations like Black Lives Matter, through Antifa and others. Some of this, as far as young people is concerned, young revolutionaries, is the nature of youth to question authority. Some of us came through the 60s and we remember the revolutions of the 60s. And so young people typically lean in on things like this. It's like the old adage that if you aren't a socialist at 20, you have no heart. And if you're still a socialist at 40, you have no head. But socialism and its sidekick, communism, Marxism, fundamentally are at odds with the Christian faith, at odds with people of faith, and ultimately seeks to suppress and control all people of faith and their churches and places of worship. So I'm going to make a bold statement and then I'm going to attempt to prove it in a short while. I have a book, by the way, that I've written called Culture Wise. You can get it through PowerPoint. My full message on socialism is in there, along with other issues that uh, we have dealt with in the past and are dealing with at this time. Culture Wise, you can go to PowerPoint and get that. But here's the statement. No one can be serious about their Christian faith and be serious about supporting socialism. Now, let me see if I can prove that. Here's why I would make such a bold and bodacious statement. Number one, socialism is totally secular, secular. It is a secular system founded upon and requiring atheism. It's true. Our faith is built upon the reality and the authority of God who exists. We believe in the risen Christ, in redemption that is, is provided in him. But socialism, Marxism, believes none of this. Karl Marx, the founder and father of scientific socialism considered religion of all kinds the opiate of the masses and believed in Charles Darwin's theories of evolution to explain the presence of life on earth. And so his goal was to abolish and to help people and nations to abolish religion. I've got a quote, I believe, from Marx that we're going to put up on the screen for you. The first requisite of the happiness of the people is the abolition of religion. And Marx in particular hated, hated Christians and Christianity and therefore sought to eliminate it in any way that he could. If God is not present, if God is not a reality, then the idea that man is nothing but an advanced animal 
a functioning machine of genetics and science. If you are made not by God, but by time and chance, then anything goes. And this is the foundation, the folly upon which this ideology is built. It is an ideology that is an idolatry. An ideology that is an idolatry because anything that replaces God is an idol. And that includes government. When government becomes your God, you have replaced the one true God. And it would be a catastrophic miscalculation to think that socialism's hostility towards religion died with Marx. It has not. This is why ch churches in China are under the control of the government. You can have a church as long as you ascribe to government control and rule. But if you get out of the church and speak of your faith, especially if you are sharing your faith publicly, you'll be arrested for disturbing the peace. Socialist countries today are completely secular and determined to root out religion and again, especially Christianity. This is why churches are detonated around the world, why Christians are persecuted in China, in the Middle East. It's why bags are inspected if you try to go into North Korea and they find a Bible, they won't find you for a long time. Pastors are continually uh, to this day arrested. Christian pastors and ministers and other people of religious faith are arrested in Cuba. Ask Gilberto Corradera, our Hispanic pastor about Cuba and Russia. And then liberal Americans, progressive unbelievers in America vote against Christian judge appointees even to the degree of calling them on the carpet for their religious expression is happening right now with Amy Barrett as her religion is under attack. She is actually a Catholic woman, a Christian woman who is a Catholic who dares to actually live her faith. Not a religious person who says they have a faith. She dares to make the terrible judgment to live out her faith and to believe what the Bible teaches and what her church teaches regarding abortion and other things. Dr. Martin Luther King said this, I promise you, Martin Luther King would not be supportive of Marxism sweeping America right now. And here's what he said, no Christian can be a communist because communism leaves out God. It regards religion as wistful thinking and the product of fear and ignorance. Martin Luther King. So, the state is worship and utopia, not the kingdom of God, but utopia is promised. If we will abandon our religion, freedom, of course, is eliminated in favor of a one world government. This is why there's so much talk today among the socialists about world government. And we know because of the book of Revelation that a one world government is coming. Marxism, socialism is not a biblical worldview. It is godless at the core. Christianity is hated and denied and dismissed as a myth. And I tell you that atheism is the central doctrine of Marxism. Number two. Why do I make the statement that no serious Christian or person of Christian faith can accept this ideology? Number two, socialism is dehumanizing. Dehumanizing. God created us in his own image, providing for us autonomy and freedom. Freedom is the gift of God. Amen. Our nation and our freedoms, a gift from God. The framers understood this, the founders, the writers of our constitution and original darkness, uh, documents certainly understood that and wrote it into the very heart that all men are created equal and the freedom of worship 
and the freedoms that we are so graciously given as an American nation and any other nation that looks to God can know this freedom. Freedom, again, is a gift of God. Let me say as strongly as I know how to say it, our hope is not in government. Our trust is not in government. Our trust is in the God of all governments, the one who rules the nations. But socialism, Marxism, progressive leftist ideologies dehumanize human beings. Because remember, if you're just an animal or the product of conception, if you're not made in the image of God, if there is no God or if God does not exist, then, then that takes away from the sanctity of the soul, the dignity of every human being. As theologian Norm Geisler has remarked, when God dies, man dies. When men and women are simply viewed as animals, Everyone who does not serve the state, both young and old, born and unborn, are expendable. You see that? Dehumanizing. The 20th century, which saw the advance of communism in the world, was the most bloodthirsty century in recent history. Many of our own American soldiers lost their lives fighting communism and for the freedom of our faith. Many of you watching, listening, viewing right now in this room, you have fought for faith and freedom to keep America free, and we thank you for it. In the midst of this fight, let me just post another slide up about the desk. Right, guys, put up the, the one about the desk. From 1917 to 2000, 100 million people were murdered under Marxist governments. I won't read those all to you. I'll just let you look at them for a moment. These nations were colossal failures of Marxism resulting in the loss of freedom, corrupt authoritarians, and one billion enslaved, enslaved citizens. Nothing leads to death like life without God. And socialism, Marxism, communism is life without God. As Christians, we hold the view that life is sacred because we, owe, we bear the image of God who has made us. We believe in God, and because we believe in God, God has given us responsibility and moral accountability. He said to the man and the woman in the garden, tend the garden, work and make a life and a livelihood for yourselves. Point number three, socialism increases poverty as it is a control device. It is a tool to control people. Socialism leads to misery, poverty, and disease, and death. Whereas the Bible, our worldview, teaches and brings freedom and value and creativity and dreaming and innovation and advancement and abundant life, a life of flourishing in freedom, where everyone has an opportunity, where everyone can find their place in life. But this other ideology, which believes in equal outcomes, noted earlier, rather than equal opportunity, is a financial failure. Look at every country and nation that has embraced it, including most recently Venezuela. Venezuela is a flourishing oil reserve country, massive wealth, beautiful country. Now the people are starving under the oppression of socialism. William Winston Churchill, the great British prime minister, uh, he said this, socialism is a philosophy of failure the creed of ignorance, and the gospel of envy. It, its inherent virtue is the equal sharing of misery. Amen. My friend Dr. Adrian Rogers quoted from a Senate record of 1958 posted by a congressman by the name of Gerald Smith who said these important words. You cannot legislate the poor into freedom by legislating the wealthy out of freedom. 
What one person receives without working for, another person must work for without receiving. The government cannot give anybody anything that the government does not first take from somebody else. When half of the people get the idea that they do not have to work because the other half is going to take care of them, and when the other half gets the idea that it does no good to work because someone else is going to get what they work for, that, my friend, is the end of any nation. And then it concludes with these words, you cannot multiply wealth by dividing it. Socialism is government-sanctioned stealing. The Bible teaches the value of hard work. We just gave you the scripture earlier that we're to live our lives in quietness and in trust of God and working with our own hands. The Bible teaches private ownership of prophecy, of property. The Bible teaches the free enterprise, many of the parables that Jesus told about those who were given talents, some Many, some, a few, describe not equal outcomes, but equal opportunities. This is taught through and through the Bible. You say, well, what about that passage in the book of Acts when they pooled all their resources together and gave it to the poor? That's not socialism. That was not controlled by government. It was for a time and a place. It was within the bonds of the church, and it emphasizes what we ought to emphasize, and that is giving and generosity, not capitalism. Or not capitalism or socialism as far as that goes. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, if a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. If that offends you, I'm sorry. But we're talking about biblical worldview here. It doesn't say if a man can't work, neither shall he eat. And Christians are charged to help the poor and those who cannot help themselves. This is a part of the ministry through and through. Many verses in the Bible about ministering and assisting the poor. It is our responsibility of Christians to care. But the same Bible says if a man is capable and will not work, he should not eat. Ecclesiastes 2.24, here's another one for you. There's nothing better than for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of of God. Amen. Work is not a curse. Work is a blessing. And God has given us an opportunity to work. So private ownership, the right of private property, it's, it's laced throughout the Scripture. A free enterprise market system decentralizes economic power. And as far as Christians are concerned, it enables us to earn more so that we can provide for our families and give more to help others around us. Socialism, on the other hand, suppresses the poor and steals from the rich and legislates theft and elevates envy in the masses. We are called and equipped as Christians to live innovative lives with initiative, to dream. This other thing, it promotes complacency. But the Christian faith, it promotes commitment to work hard, to pray hard, to love well, and to serve God. And I can just tell you that not only the socialists, but those in this nation, the left side of politics, the opponents of capitalism rarely have a biblical worldview. In fact, I can't name you one. I'm sure there are some. But we have an old debating tool, trick, that says uh, in debating when you're in the middle of a, a debate that the exception proves the rule. The exception proves the rule. If there are exceptions to this, it only proves the rule. That this is not a biblical worldview. Number four and finally, socialism leads to a loss of religious freedom. Not only economic, the loss of economic freedom and national freedom, but Religious freedom. May God bless America and America, Americans as we seek to bless our nation with the gospel, with the love of Christ, that we have the freedom to do this. America is known as a loving country, and we have been the primary proponent of gospel witness around the world 
in the last 200 years at least. I believe God is waking people up. He is getting our attention. I do remain a hopeful optimist. But again, our hope is not in ourselves. Our hope is not in our government. Our hope is in the God of all governments. The one who is the way and the truth and the life. I believe that spiritual transformation is possible. That a gospel revolution can, can happen in our lifetimes. As long as we can remain free. And even if our freedom is taken away, we cannot help but speak of the things that we have seen and heard. What is vital is that we pass this truth, this biblical worldview to our children and our children's children. One, one final word uh, regarding America and what people think about America. Um, I have it right here. A Chinese businessman came to our country looking for the secret of the success of America and in particular the West. Rodney Stark, who wrote this history, spoke of this man's words. He said, we studied, this is the Chinese businessman, who said, we studied everything we could from an historical, political, economic, and cultural perspective. At first, we thought it was because you had more powerful guns than we have. Then we thought it was because you had the best political system. Next, we focused on your economic system. But in the past 20 years, we have realized that the heart of your culture is your religion, Christianity. That is why the West is so powerful. The Christian moral foundation of social and cultural life was what made possible the emergence of capitalism and then the successful transition to democratic politics. We don't have any doubt about this. Amen. What makes America great is our God, our freedom that comes from Him in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't bleak. Church, don't blink on this. Would you bow in prayer? I know it's an unusual time to give an invitation, but the only answer to your life and your future is Jesus Christ. Watching online, Worshiping in this room, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, now's the time. The urgency and the emergency of our times require people of faith, and God is calling you. God loves you. It begins when you accept the fact that you are a sinner and you can't save yourself. You see, this whole socialistic thing, it, it says man doesn't need redemption. Man hasn't sinned. Man doesn't need salvation. He just needs a boost from the government. No, you need Jesus. So admit that you are a sinner, that you need a Savior. Jesus is the Savior. He died on the cross for you. He rose again. He lives. And he said, words of Jesus, God so loved the world, you. Put your name there. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Believe and receive the Lord Jesus. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to be called the children of God. Believe and receive. Pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I invite you to come into my life. I believe you died for me and rose again. I turn from my sin and I trust completely in you. Save me, Lord. Forgive my sins. Live in my life. And give me the hope the confidence that when I die or when you come again that I will be with you forever in heaven. Do you know that you're going to heaven? Settle it today if you don't by receiving and trusting in God. You're not saved by your good deeds, your good works, trying your harder. Whether you have money, you don't have money. Whether you are a socialist, a capitalist, an American, a Russian, a European, an African, you need Jesus. God's grace is for every person, every race of people. Would you trust in Jesus today? 
I'm going to ask those of you watching online to type in 74788 and then text in Jesus. 74788 is on the screen right now. Text in J-E-S-U-S. -S. There's someone standing by. We want to give you a Bible. We want to follow up. We'll pray with you. We'll encourage you. And then those in the room, I'm going to ask you to do something bold. And that's to take a stand, a public stand. Because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father in heaven. That means open public profession of faith. Confess him openly. Your Christian faith is certainly personal, but it's never private. Go public today. I'm going to ask that you come forward. Say, what's going to happen? We'll have a brief word with you. We'll answer your questions from God's Word. If you have questions, we'll give you a Bible. You can walk out of here in the freedom of Christ. Others want to join Preston Wood Church. You believe as we believe, and you want to belong as we belong to this great church. We would love to have you. And I'm going to ask you, if you want to move your membership or transfer your membership to Prestonwood today, to your believer, but you belong somewhere else. God's maybe led you to our community. You're new to our community. During this time, maybe you've been visiting our church and you just believe God is leading you to join Prestonwood. I want to encourage you to lead the way, come forward. If you've not had baptism, as the Bible teaches baptism, We'll baptize you at another time. If you're a baptized believer, we'll receive you as a member. But God bless you as you make your way. If you'd like to come and kneel and pray today at these steps as an altar, you can do that. Lord, take now this time of decision. May your Holy Spirit move in response to your word and to your truth. Bring people to Jesus today, online and on site, right here, right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for worship at Prestonwood. As you heard earlier, if you made a decision for Christ, please text JESUS to 74788. We would love to connect with you and give you these great resources to help you grow in your faith. One is a New Believer's Bible with helpful notes to help you study God's Word. The other is a book by Pastor Jack Graham on the next steps to take as you pursue this new life in Christ. As we close, I'd like to thank you for your faithful giving to support Prestonwood and the work God is doing through our ministries. If you would like to give, text word GIVE to 74788 or visit prestonwood.org give. It's been a joy worshiping with you, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.